the advantages of being a professor is you can read about anything and call it research. So I started reading both about uh, gun control policy and constitutional law just because it was interesting. And I found, quite to my surprise, that in fact the individual rights view uh, really is historically, uh, by, all, by all means, the best attested one. In the 1960s, I carried a gun as a civil rights worker. Uh, in 1975, I became a law professor and I began researching uh, issues involving uh, gun ownership, self-defense, so on. I was a young lawyer living alone in the Hollywood Hills and somebody tried to break into my house in the middle of the night. That man didn't get into my house, but it was a lesson that stayed with me for the rest of my life. I went out, I went to a gun store, eventually bought a firearm and learned how to use it safely and responsibly. I'm Dave Hardy and I'll be your host today. My own search for the meaning of the Second Amendment began here, at what was in the 1970s the College of Law and headquarters of the Arizona Law Review. I was writing an article for the review and my editor suggested I add a segment on the meaning of the Second Amendment. I told him I didn't think there was much to be said. I was wrong. But that was the 1970s. In, in from about 1930 till about 1970, there was hardly any legal scholarship on, on the Second Amendment. Uh, perhaps a dozen articles that really addressed the Second Amendment uh, in, in any kind of detail at all, and, and not even very many articles which even made a passing reference uh, to the Second Amendment. It was a time when the Second Amendment was very much alive in the, the minds of the public and continuing to exercise their Second Amendment rights, but it was a time when the, the legal scholarly community wasn't paying much attention to the Second Amendment one way or the other. It's a different situation today when there are over a hundred law review articles discussing the right to arms, including some by the biggest names in American constitutional law. Professor Sanford Levinson of Texas, William Van Alstine of William & Mary. There are also numerous books on the subject. Professor Curtis's Comprehensive History of the 14th Amendment, Professor Akhil Amar's Study of the Bill of Rights, legal historian Leonard Levy's book on the same subject. Levy's book criticized Professor Larry Tribe's textbook, American Constitutional Law, for not acknowledging the growing evidence of an individual right to arms. While Levy's book was still at the presses, Professor Tribe brought out a new edition of his textbook, accepting that very evidence. What caused the sudden turnaround? One article. The recent boom in Second Amendment scholarship that has led most scholars to conclude that it protects an individual right really did begin with the work of Don Cates in the Michigan Law Review. Uh, I'm a good friend of Sandy Levinson's and I know that he was influenced by that article. Um, and then many of us were influenced by Sandy. So, you know, that's what kind of got the snowball going down the hill. And it's just gathered more and more steam as it has. But it is pretty impressive that uh, top scholars, top liberal constitutional scholars like Professor Sandy Levinson at the University of Texas writing the Yale Law Journal, uh, Duke Law Professor Bill Van Alstyne, uh, really very big names have made it quite clear uh, that their research uh, uh, reveals that this is an individual, a Second Amendment that secures an individual right. We know an awful lot more about the Second Amendment now than we did before. In England, at least uh, at the beginning, uh, there was no royal army. The king was dependent upon the citizen militia. Uh, they had laws that essentially required every Englishman to be armed. Everyone was required to own arms. Everyone was required to show up at various times with those arms. Uh, they were required to have arms that were suitable for their condition. So that if you were a duke, uh, you might have to have a charger and a full set of armor. Whereas a uh, poor villain who lived on 10 acres uh, could get by with having a pike or a longbow. Henry VIII went farther and lowered the age requirement. Now starting at age seven, fathers were required to provide their sons with bows and arrows and see that they constantly practice shooting with them. Every man having a man-child or men-children in his house shall provide, ordain, and have in his house for every man-child being of the age of seven years and above until he shall come to the age of seventeen years a bow and two shafts to enthuse and learn them and bring them up in shooting an act concerning shooting in longbows. 
1511. By the end of Henry's reign, early firearms known as harquebuses were in common use. Henry's daughter Elizabeth oversaw the changeover from bows to harquebuses and also the organization of English civilians into what came to be known as the militia, governed by her lord's lieutenant. The Calendar of State Papers, the official index of government documents for a reign, shows her council demanding reports on the militia and on what every lord lieutenant was doing to promote harquebus ownership and shooting. The last entry on the page shows how far some lord's lieutenant were willing to go to make sure that their people owned firearms and practiced shooting with them. But how did the duty to have arms come to be seen as a right to have them? We asked Professor Joyce Malcolm, a fellow of the Royal Historical Society and whose book on the subject was published by Harvard University Press. She found that the change arose out of the chaos of 17th century England when conflict arose between King Charles I and his parliament. In 1642, civil war broke out between King and Parliament. King Charles was eventually captured and beheaded. His sons, the future Charles II and James II, fled to France and England came to be ruled by Oliver Cromwell's military dictatorship. Oliver Cromwell, who was the most successful general throughout the parliament, took over and ruled by himself for some years. And when he died, his son came to, the, uh, to power, but there was just chaos. And eventually, out of desperation, uh, the English people uh, formed a kind of parliament and asked the uh, heir to the Stuart throne, Charles II, to come back and rule. Charles the second came back to a country that was really well armed by an army that had executed his father. He was naturally very anxious. He had very few guns at his own command. And so he, uh, through the Privy Council, through his own council, uh, instituted controls on uh, gun makers. They had to report every Saturday night um, to the uh, government what guns they had produced in the course of the week, um, who had bought them, uh, there were controls on importing weapons. There were licenses if you wanted to move weapons around the countryside. You had to get a pass to do that. And then there were a, a series of orders to disarm all sorts of people who he felt were um, likely to be opponents or had been opponents in the past. So there was a lot of disarming that went on. And then there was this effort to really control the guns that were being manufactured in the country. One of the acts that the new parliament of royalists passed was the Militia Act of 1662. And this act actually gave militia officers who were country gentlemen of the right sort, power to disarm anyone that they felt was likely to be an opponent of the crown. When the Militia Act was first passed, it was the orders about disarming were very rigorously followed. So when there were, you know, fears of a plot to overthrow the king or to have an uprising, orders would go out to the lieutenants general in the different counties to disarm potential opponents, and they actually did it. But I think after a while, year after year of these alarms, uh, they began to be rather tired of, of this exercise. In 1671, Parliament passed a Game Act, which was actually um, a far broader control of the ownership of firearms than England had ever had before. It was meant uh, ostensibly to allow a gentleman on his own property to um, make sure that only he and equally privileged people were able to hunt game. Um, but it, it listed a whole series of prohibited weapons that were used for hunting, and at the head of the list were guns. What happened was that uh, after Charles dies and his brother takes over, James II, who was an avowed Catholic, tries to use the Game Act to disarm all people who were not financially um, legally able to be armed, according to that law, and sent out orders to the Lord's lieutenants to disarm vast numbers of people. And that does not seem to have happened at all. So it doesn't seem to have been um, carried out, but it did frighten people. Finally, in 1688, the English decided they'd had enough. At the invitation of English noblemen, James' daughter Mary and her husband William sailed from the Netherlands. Thousands of people flocked into him, and James's army did what was called melting away, and, um, and James had to flee. So there was a new king and queen, and in order to sort of regularize their position, because James was still alive and claiming to be king, 
a convention parliament was called and the convention parliament decided that they needed a bill of rights to reaffirm all the rights that they felt had been imperiled by James II. It wasn't the complete panoply of rights, but the rights that they felt needed bolstering. And in order to tie the new king to an obligation to abide by those rights, the same statute that elevated William and Mary to the throne contained these rights, the Charter of Rights, uh, that they claimed were their ancient and indubitable rights. And one of these was the right for Protestant subjects to have arms for their defense, suitable to their condition and as allowed by law. We know about the deliberations of this convention parliament that discussed the need to have what they called a new Magna Carta uh, through the records of Lord Summers who um, chaired it and through some of the other members who kept diaries. Summers' notes show quite clearly that arms seizures under the Militia Act were a major topic of debate while the Declaration of Rights was being drafted, and even that some members of Parliament complained they had personally been targets of the arms confiscations. So by 1688, the medieval duty to be armed had been changed in English thought to a right to be armed. English culture spread to the New World after three small ships arrived in the vast wilderness soon to be called Virginia. The colonists who sailed knew they were entering a hostile environment. They faced raids from rival French and Dutch colonists, not to mention the ever-present danger of Indian attack. It's not too surprising that their arms laws were even stricter than those of early England. Some laws dictated what arms and ammunition each colonist was expected to bring with him when he came to the New World. Others required each colonist to carry arms whenever he was in a place that might be vulnerable to attack. Some of the early colonies insisted that people who went outside of the colony to the fields to farm, to church on Sunday, had to actually carry their weapons with them. And there's this very famous painting of the pilgrims going to church with their weapons, uh, but actually it was a uh, legislation in colony after colony. They all instituted a militia. They all instituted requirements for householders to be armed. One statute provided that every male inhabitant shall always go armed, including to church or any other place. And uh, that was not limited to the militia because there was really no age group. I think adulthood was probably implicit in it. As the colonies grew, the laws went beyond mandating individual arms ownership and carrying. Historian Clayton Kramer explains. The instructions given to colonial governors by the uh, royal government are very clear. You're to go ahead and organize militias, and they did. Uh, it, Pennsylvania is the last of the colonies to go ahead and create a mandatory militia. And all of the others, almost from the beginning, there are laws that require that um, free white men own guns. In some cases, even free black men are required to own guns. Uh, there are laws that require a head of household to have guns for uh, all of the uh, members of the militia that are in, in, the, uh, in the household. In a few places like Maryland, the law is explicit. His, hers, or theirs. So they're saying that uh, women are required to own guns if they are the head of household, and there are men within their household who are members of the militia. Beyond the legal requirements, the colonists collected guns for the fun of it. As this ad in the Virginia Gazette shows, men like Patrick Henry were always on the lookout for a good gun. Colonial governors, of course, had the best opportunities, with entire armories at their disposal. Rather than letting the guns rest in storage, some of them used them for interior decoration, as shown at this recreated governor's palace in Williamsburg, Virginia but the colonists were not the only ones who enjoyed firearms. Uh, eventually, uh, most colonies began to realize that uh, two things happen when you make guns more readily available to the Indians. Uh, one of them is that they um, become quite dependent on Europeans for gunpowder. Uh, it does not appear that the Indians ever quite figured out how to uh, make uh, gunpowder. Uh, there's uh, one moment, uh, one point in the, uh, in the 1630s, uh, 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 a couple of uh, uh, English girls, 11, 12, 13, something like that, are uh, kidnapped by one of the Indian tribes uh, who seem convinced that uh, all of the Europeans know how to make gunpowder. And they're very disappointed to find out that these two little girls had absolutely no idea how to make it. Apart from the duty to bear arms and the pleasure they took in owning them, the colonists knew that as Britons they had the right to arms. To confirm that, they had only to open the second most popular book in America, the first being the Bible. William Blackstone's great treatise on the common law, written in the 1760s, was extremely widely circulated in the United States, and, and Blackstone, really the, probably the most influential 
legal commentator ever ever to write in English, or maybe ever to write in the known solar system in any language, uh, talked about the the right to arms as one of the uh, rights uh, that are possessed by all English subjects. And he explained that it was not only for it was for security, but it was especially for their right to resist against tyranny as a last resort. That that was the main purpose of the right uh, was to per- so that the the people in the community, every one of them with their own firearms, could per- could overthrow a dictatorship in in the the last resort if none of the other uh, checks and balances in the English system worked. For a century and a half, the American colonies were treated with benign neglect by the home government. This had the usual result of governmental neglect. They prospered. Then in the 1760s, the British leadership decided to make the colonies a paying proposition for the home country, and relations quickly declined. A large detachment of British troops was sent to occupy Boston, and things went downhill from there. In 1768, the Redcoats came to Boston. Um, when they were, the colonists became aware, um, they were extremely um, upset. Um, the main patriotic newspaper at that time, the Boston Gazette, published uh, alarming um, a- anticipations of what could happen, including that the inhabitants were going to be disarmed, that uh, colonists were going to be taken to England to be tried, uh, not with a jury of their peers. So. Uh, when, when the Redcoats arrived, they were uh, quartered among the people, and what took place, um, murder, robbery, rape, uh, they really were, to some extent, a criminal uh, organization. Reports of increasing conflict between troops and civilians were circulated by Patriot Committees of Correspondence and reprinted by newspapers throughout the colonies. The articles announced that the local residents were arming themselves in self-defense against the Redcoats' criminal tendencies. The committees of correspondence cited the 1689 Bill of Rights and the colonies' militia laws as proof that they were within their rights in arming for self-preservation. They also invoked Blackstone's reference to the right to arms as security against a day when the sanctions of society and law failed to protect against oppression. Just when you think nothing could go wrong, it often does. The British establishment in the colonies was about to have a series of such experiences. First, General Gage had spies in Boston, and they tipped him off that the colonists were creating an enormous arms dump, complete with artillery, in nearby Concord. On the night of April 18, 1775, Gage sent a column of troops to destroy the supplies. Their march led them through the town of Lexington, where they confronted a small body of American militia. A shot went off. No one knows who fired it. Could even have been an accident. But the result was immediate. A conflict had begun and the British had drawn first blood. Things worsened from there. The British column moved on to Concord where it found the supplies and also several thousand angry militiamen outside the town. When the British began to burn the supplies, the militiamen thought the British were burning the town and attacked. The British were forced to retreat and the retreat became a 15-mile running battle as still more militia turned out to intercept them. By the time the Redcoats got back to Boston, they'd suffered nearly 300 casualties. They not only had drawn first blood, they'd been defeated. Things continued to worsen. The one British hope at this point would have been to confine the fighting to Massachusetts. The Patriots in Boston were known to be, well, rather hot-headed, and perhaps the other colonies would write it off as a local dispute. What turned local conflict into continent-wide war occurred here, at the Williamsburg Armory in Virginia. The colony used this building to store the public reserves of gunpowder, ready for issue in the event of war or emergency. Late on the night of April 20, 1775, a group of British sailors crept through the town and broke into the armory. They had been ordered by Lord Dunmore, the royal governor, to grab the powder and take it aboard ship. Word of Lexington had not yet reached the colony, but Patrick Henry had been pushing the legislature to strengthen and ready its militia, and Governor Dunmore thought seizing the powder was a wise move. It wasn't. The Virginians were outraged. News of the armory raid was still spreading when news of the fighting at Lexington arrived. Raids on militia supplies in both North and South suggested but one conclusion. The British were moving to disarm all the colonies. The largest colony in the South was driven into alliance with the most powerful colony in New England. The fight outside Boston had become an American revolution. But even as the armies fought, there was a bit of legal housekeeping to be done. 
In 1776, the colonies declared their independence from Great Britain. Many of the new states immediately began working on written constitutions and bills of rights. Here at Gunston Hall in Virginia, George Mason began work on what became the Virginia Declaration of Rights of 1776. The first major Declaration of Rights that was adopted by a, a newly independent state was that of Virginia. The Virginia Declaration of Rights authored by George Mason and that declaration sets forth a doctrine of natural rights such that all men are created equally free and independent and that they have a right to defend their lives and their property. Um, <clears throat> there were a number of rights set forth in that declaration and one of which was a declaration that a well-regulated militia composed of the body of the people trained to arms is the natural and effective and safe defense of a free society. Mason's proposal was not the only one. Young Thomas Jefferson submitted a draft Virginia Bill of Rights that included a clearly individual right to arms. This individual rights approach took hold in the next constitutional convention, that of Pennsylvania. The Pennsylvania Declaration was more extensive than Virginia's and it included recognition for um, a right of the people to bear arms in defense of themselves and the state. The people, not the government, not the militia, the people have a right to bear arms for the defense of themselves and the state. So it's not just that the government has a right to have a militia to defend the government, it's the people have a right to arms and one of the purposes for having the right to arms is to defend themselves. Finally, in, in 1780, Massachusetts adopted a Declaration of Rights, and it worded in, in this regard that the people have a right to keep and bear arms for the common defense. The first time the word keep arms appears in one of the colonial declarations. Thus, Americans of the period chose two or perhaps three approaches to the right to arms. The Virginia model praised the militia without really ordering the government to do anything specific about it. The Pennsylvania model didn't mention the militia but protected an individual right to arms. The Massachusetts model took the Pennsylvania approach but added a right to keep arms and a limitation referring to the common defense. These models would become important when, a decade later, a new nation decided to draft a national bill of rights. Initially, the colonies were organized under the Articles of Confederation, a very loose organizational structure. For example, each state got an equal vote in Congress, and it took a two-thirds majority to raise taxes, form an army, or do almost anything worthwhile. It soon was apparent that the national government needed more power, and Congress authorized a convention to propose amendments to the Articles. After months of debate, the convention proposed not amendments, but a complete replacement, entitled the Constitution of the United States. The convention called for ratifying conventions to be summoned in each state and provided that it would become effective when nine states had ratified. The proposed constitution greatly expanded federal powers, giving Congress virtually unlimited authority to tax, to spend, and to raise an army. The expansion of federal power was controversial. Seven delegates to the convention walked out and refused to sign it. A controversy immediately erupted. Why didn't it have a Bill of Rights? Why didn't the proposed federal constitution have a declaration of rights like Virginia's or Pennsylvania's or that of one of the other states? There were other controversies between what those who came to be known as the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists, but by and large the Federalists wanted adoption of the Constitution without a Bill of Rights. The Anti-Federalists wanted the um, if the Constitution was adopted, which many of them did not want, but if it was, that there should certainly be a Bill of Rights to protect the people. The, the first states to ratify did so without um, offering a Bill of Rights, but when Massachusetts came to consider the proposed federal constitution, the great patriot Samuel Adams, who in some ways is the perhaps the strongest uh, unsung hero of the Second Amendment, because his writings on the right of the people to keep and bear arms go back for, to pre-revolutionary times, back to 1768. Samuel Adams proposed in the Massachusetts ratification convention that the Constitution shall never be construed to violate the rights of free conscience or religion or to 
prevent the people who are peaceable citizens from keeping their own arms. Pennsylvania um, was one of the biggest states and there you had a very significant anti-federalist group. <clears throat> they were a bare minority and that state, the ratification convention of that state, decided to um, adopt the federal constitution without the Declaration of Rights. Very controversial decision. But the anti-federalist group drafted their own um, document which was called the Descent of the Minority. And in that document, a Declaration of Rights, quite a lengthy one actually, was advocated. And one of those provisions was recognition of the right of the people to, to bear arms in defense of themselves, the state, for killing game. Um, and the provision there was also that no person could be disarmed unless they had been, they had done something to forfeit that, their, that right, like been in actual rebellion. New Hampshire adopted a Declaration of Rights. This was the first time that a majority in the convention had adopted a Declaration of Rights, which they recommended. This was significant for two reasons. One, New Hampshire was the ninth state to ratify the Constitution. That was the necessary two-thirds to make it effective. So from that ratification on, there would be definitely a United States of America organized under this new Constitution. <clears throat> but New Hampshire was also the first state where a majority of the delegates recommended a, a Declaration of Rights. And once again, you have the proposal, among others, there were three individual rights, as I recall, that were recommended, free speech and press and religion, and the right of the peaceable citizens to, to bear arms. The fight was not over. The Constitution still lacked ratification by the two most powerful states, Virginia and New York, not to mention North Carolina and Rhode Island. Without them, the Union would be decidedly incomplete, not to mention physically fragmented. In Virginia, the battle would be especially difficult. Two of its delegates to the Constitutional Convention, George Mason and Edmund Pendleton, had refused to sign the new Constitution and returned home to oppose its ratification. They were joined by Patrick Henry, the Commonwealth's former governor and its most powerful orator. The trio not only opposed ratification, they were already calling for a second Constitutional Convention to undo the work of the first. The view in Virginia was that a, uh, a Bill of Rights was uh, the, the very least that a government owed to a citizen, and uh, Mason was uh, very clear that no self-respecting Bill of Rights could do without a right to bear arms. In the Virginia ratifying convention, delegates heard both Patrick Henry's soaring oratory, The great object is that every man be armed and the more measured arguments of his ally, George Mason. Although Mason was a strong supporter of the militia system, he now saw threats to that system as a means to a worse end, disarmament of the entire people by the new government. Forty years ago, when the resolution of enslaving America was formed in Great Britain, the British Parliament was advised by an artful man who was governor of Pennsylvania to disarm the people, that it was the best and most effectual way to enslave them, but that they should not do it openly, but weaken them, and let them sink gradually by totally disusing and neglecting the militia. Virginia ratified, and w there you had a um, two basic recommended kinds of amendments. One, Declaration of Rights, and in, in that case you had George Mason's pen again at work, and the arms guarantee read that the people have a right to keep and bear arms, or rather that the right of the people to keep and bear arms should not be infringed, semicolon, a well-regulated militia composed of the body of the people trained to arms being the necessary security of a free state, an anti-standing army provision, a provision that the, the civilian power shall predominate over the military. So there you had, in the Virginia Convention, a Declaration of Rights supported by James Madison, those who had been instrumental in framing the Constitution at Philadelphia. You had a great compromise where the Declaration would be recommended. Again, it was not mandatory. It was a good faith attempt uh, to, to tell the first Federal Congress that you shall consider a Declaration of Rights. Uh, the compromise was a promise by James Madison 
uh, in Virginia that we will put a Bill of Rights into the Constitution as one of the first things we do if you will just ratify the Constitution. Now, Madison actually was a trustworthy man. He was known to others to be a trustworthy man. They agreed, the other politicians involved, that they would trust him and accept that compromise. When drafting its demand for a guarantee of a right to arms, the Virginia Convention went back to the state declarations of rights. Here they had a clear model in the Pennsylvania and Massachusetts declarations of rights. Massachusetts had expanded on Pennsylvania's wording by referring to keep and bear arms, but narrowed it by making it keep and bear for the common defense. The Virginia Convention, of course, knew of its own Commonwealth Declaration of Rights, which had stressed the importance of the militia. The Virginians incorporated both ideas and in the broadest form. From Massachusetts, they took the right both to keep and bear arms, but with the common defense limitation stripped away. Then the Virginians added a semicolon and attached their own Commonwealth's Declaration of Rights, which cited the importance of the militia. When they had finished, they had recognized the right in the broadest terms yet used as to both aspects of arms bearing. The Virginia call for ratification and call for a Bill of Rights talks about a militia. It also talks about the right of the people to keep and bear arms. It's two separate thoughts. New York's convention came next and was preceded by a remarkable written debate. On the Anti-Federalist side were the letters from the Federal Farmer, of which thousands of copies were distributed. Historians still debate the identity of the Federal Farmer. Uh, some scholars say it was Richard Henry Lee, others say Melanchthon Smith. Whoever the author was, he was influential, and argued that congressional power might be abused both with regard to the militia and with regard to individual arms. The Federal Farmer argued that the new government might subvert the militia system by creating a select militia, a smaller force composed of volunteers and given special training. This and a standing army would lead to neglect of the general militia. The Federal Farmer argued that survival of freedom depended upon the populace in general being armed and disciplined. An initial Federalist answer to these arguments came from Noah Webster, the future lexicographer. Webster's newspaper columns argued that Americans' near-universal armament made federal abuses impossible. With guns in almost every household, there was no reason to fear the new government. Any misuse of the army would lead not to oppression, but to armed resistance and the annihilation of the oppressors. The New York debates also spawned the Federalist's greatest political work, the Federalist Papers, 85 essays authored by James Madison, Alexander Hamilton, and James Jay. In Federalist 46, James Madison took on the issue of congressional power to create a standing army. The anti-federalist argument had been that standing armies were dangerous to liberty, whereas militias were safe. Madison brilliantly turned the argument on its head, arguing that it represented a false dichotomy. We could have both an army and a militia, and universal citizen armament ensured that the army could never threaten liberty. Madison began by calculating that the nation could not afford an army of more than about 30,000 men. These 30,000 would be outnumbered by half a million trained militia, officered by men appointed by the states, who would oppose any abuses. The way you prevent governments from becoming despotic is to have out there 500,000 or 5 million armed citizens who have the right to say no. Now you look at me and you say, oh, that's NRA propaganda from 1990. No, actually, it's James Madison himself writing in the Federalist 46, uh, telling people why they can safely ratify the Constitution, because you will never have to worry about the standing army becoming tyrannical because the people, all of the people, will have arms and can never be pushed around. New York ratified with a call for a Bill of Rights that closely paralleled that of Virginia. The United States was to have a new government and the fall of 1789 saw its first national elections. Despite the strenuous opposition of Patrick Henry, James Madison was elected to the House of Representatives. Madison, who many considered the father of the Constitution, also became the father of our Bill of Rights.
Madison spent the winter of 1789 in his mansion at Montpier, drafting an American Bill of Rights. When he set out for the first Congress, he had his ideas well in hand. He knew the guarantee of right to arms had to be a high priority. In the ratification process, state after state after state had had lengthy discussions about the things that ought to be in a Bill of Rights. Five states had significant discussions on a right to keep and bear arms element in the Bill of Rights. Only three states had a comparable discussion about the right of free speech. On June the 8th, 1789, James Madison stood up in the first federal Congress and proposed what became the Federal Bill of Rights. Included among the proposed amendments was the language from Virginia, New York, North Carolina that the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. A declaration as part of that same clause that a well-regulated militia is the best security of a free country. He used the term free country, not free state. What Madison did to create the Second Amendment was quite simple. He took the Virginia and New York proposals. He also made a few additions, such as a right of conscientious objectors to avoid personal military service, but the First Congress promptly cut those out, returning the amendment to a shortened form of the Virginia and New York format. The First Congress then reversed the order of the two clauses so that the Militia Clause became a preface to the right of the people. Madison's proposal for a Bill of Rights was not the only one floated in the First Congress. There were a great many Anti-Federalists who wanted to change the Constitution in the Bill of Rights to provide that there was indeed state control over the militia which the federal government could not undercut. Now, after Madison introduced the Second Amendment and the rest of the Bill of Rights, there was a small committee formed to work on the language and come back to the entire House of Representatives uh, with language that, uh, that they would then consider. That committee consisted of Madison, a guy by the name of Roger Sherman, and one other representative. Roger Sherman was an anti-federalist. Now, we know now, but we didn't know for 150 years after the Constitution, uh, the Bill of Rights was ratified, that Roger Sherman had written his own version of the Bill of Rights, that he had written a version of the Second Amendment that is exactly the exclusive state's rights version that the Ninth Circuit hopes the Constitution means. Uh, and if he wrote it out and he spent that much time thinking about it, he must have presented it to the committee that he was a member of, which we know turned it down because the language that went to the House of Representatives is essentially the language that we see today in the Second Amendment. The First Congress did one more thing of importance. While we have no record of the debates in the First Senate, we do have the Senate Journal, which lists motions made and votes taken. In the Senate, which kept better records, uh, there was a motion made to put into the Second Amendment the words, you have the right to keep and bear arms for the common defense. So what does the Senate do? It rejects it. Passed in the negative, which is 17th century language for it failed. There's additional evidence of how the amendment was understood at the time from the writings of a prominent Federalist author. Starting in, in 1787, Madison and Tench Cox had, had worked as allies together in the cause of, of building public support uh, for the, the ratification of the Constitution. They'd ex exchanged letters, and Madison had, had complimented Cox on his work, tried to have it ensure that Cox's work uh, was reprinted in Madison's home state of Virginia, and you know, praised Cox for his efforts. And this was really the, the building of a, uh, a lifelong alliance. Uh, Cox would eventually serve uh, in the Treasury Department uh, and uh, 
the sub-cabinet of, of uh, Madison's Treasury Department when Madison became president uh, over two decades later. In 1789, U.S. Representative James Madison proposed what became the, the Bill of Rights as amendments to the Constitution, and Cox, as usual, was out of the box very early in support of Madison, and he wrote something that was probably, the, as far as we know, the most comprehensive clause-by-clause -clause analysis of that, the Bill of Rights that was available to the American public during the ratification period when the state legislatures were considering whether to adopt the various parts of the Bill of Rights. One of the leading Federalist writers, Tinch Cox of Philadelphia, um, <clears throat> published under the pen name A Pennsylvanian an explanation of these proposed amendments. And for what became the, the Second Amendment, he offered the following explanation that as civil rulers will not, uh, as civil rulers may tyrannize over the people and may use standing armies to oppress them, the people are guaranteed by this article in their right to keep and bear their private arms. So you have not only the literal language of the Second Amendment as proposed, the people have a right, but uh, which arms were they? They were private arms, the, the arms belonging to the people. This was reprinted throughout the colonies. It was printed on a special um, front page of a special July the 4th issue in, in uh, a Massachusetts newspaper. And James Madison wrote Tinch Cox a, a, a nice letter, a thank you note, basically, saying that I appreciate your support and um, your explanation of these amendments will have a healing tendency. The, the healing tendency meaning the fact that um, um, the, the anti-federalist trust needed to be regained so that they would support the new government. Uh, likewise, there, are, there were leading commentators, both in the late 1700s writing about English constitutional tradition and throughout the 1800s writing about uh, uh, the U.S. Constitution, including Justice Joseph Story, Supreme Court Justice, the leading constitutional commentator uh, of the 19th century, uh, Michigan Supreme Court Justice Thomas Cooley, the leading constitutional commentator of the late 19th century, Sir William Blackstone, uh, the leading English legal commentator, was very influential on the framers uh, in the, in the uh, late half of the 18th century, all of them treated the right as an individual right. St. George Tucker was originally famous to the American people as one of the great war heroes of the American Revolution in Virginia, but he became much more significant in the long term in American history for the tremendously important legal treatise he wrote. Uh, James Madison was a guy who thought very highly of, of St. George Tucker and his legal work. In fact, Madison appointed uh, Tucker to the uh, federal courts as a judge in uh, 1813, where, where Tucker served until 1827. But what Tucker was probably most enduringly famous for was writing an American edition of Blackstone. Blackstone was the, the great foundational treatise of the English common law. But now that America was an independent country, it was time for a treatise which showed how the American law was developing and how it was differing from English law. Uh, Tucker has forever after been seen as really one of the perhaps the best source of the original intent and early interpretation of American Constitution and, and of early American law. He's been cited by the United States Supreme Court over 40 times. Here's what uh, Tucker wrote uh, about Blackstone's exposition of the right to arms as it existed in English law. He put him, Tucker through in his own footnotes and explained how that applied to the United States. And he said, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed, and this without any qualification as to their condition or degree, as is the case in the British government. Because Blackstone had said that the British right to arms was for Protestants only, and there were also things in there about their qualification and degree. And then in, in Tucker's appendix, he elaborated more on, on the American Second Amendment and, and the rest of the Constitution. The Second Amendment, he said, may be considered as the true palladium of liberty. The right of self-defense is the first law of nature. In most governments, it has been the study of rulers to confine this right within the narrowest limits possible. Wherever standing armies are kept up, 
and the right of the people to keep and bear arms is, under any color or pretext whatsoever, prohibited. Liberty, if not already annihilated, is on the brink of destruction. Tucker's American Blackstone was the, the leading American constitutional treatise until 1825 when there was a new book published uh, by a guy named William Rawl uh, called A View of the Constitution of the United States of America. Rawl had been a, a member of the Pennsylvania legislature that had ratified the, the Second Amendment and the rest of the Bill of Rights. Uh, George Washington asked, liked Rawl so much that he asked him to serve as the first Attorney General of the United States. And Rawl turned that down, but he was appointed by Washington as United States Attorney uh, for Pennsylvania. Here's what his treatise said about the Second Amendment. It said, uh, it is declared that a well-regulated militia is necessary to the security of a free state, a proposition from which few will dissent. Although in actual war, the services of regular troops are confessedly more valuable, yet while peace prevails, and at the commencement of war before a regular force can be raised, the militia form the palladium of the country. The corollary from this first position is that the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. The prohibition is general. No clause in the Constitution could by any rule of construction be conceived to give to Congress a power to disarm the people. Rawl is one of the typical 19th century commentators who says, sure, a militia is very important and here's why. And because of that, because a militia is such a great thing, that's why the right of the people to keep and bear arms is so important. The most influential legal author of the late 19th and early 20th centuries was Thomas Cooley. He served as a judge on the Michigan Supreme Court from 1864 to 1885. He was Republican and would have been appointed to the Supreme Court because of his outstanding and well-recognized legal mind, but the Republican presidents of the time were uh, somewhat afraid of his uh, well-known uh, streak of legal independence. He was uh, called the nation's elder statesman on matters of constitutional law and the greatest authority on constitutional law in the world. Uh, from his 1880 book, The General Principles of Constitutional Law, and this is where he goes into the most depth on the right to keep and bear arms. The right is general. It may be supposed from the phraseology of this provision that the right to keep and bear arms was only guaranteed to the militia, but this would be an interpretation not warranted by the intent. The militia, as has been elsewhere explained, consists of those persons who, under the law, are liable for the performance of military duty and are officered and enrolled for service when called upon. But the law may make provision for the enrollment of all who are fit to perform military duty, or of a small number only, or it may wholly omit to make any provision at all. And indeed, that's the situation we have now, where no one is required uh, to serve in the militia. And if the right were limited to those enrolled, the purpose of this guarantee might be defeated altogether by the action or neglect to act of the government it was meant to hold in check. The meaning of the provision undoubtedly is that the people from whom the militia must be taken shall have the right to keep and bear arms and they need no permission or regulation of law for the purpose. But this enables the government to have a well-regulated militia. For to bear arms implies something more than the mere keeping. It implies the learning to handle and use them in a way that makes those who keep them ready for their efficient use. In other words, it implies the right to meet for voluntary discipline in arms, observing and doing so the laws of public order. We have statements made immediately before the Second Amendment is proposed, while the Second Amendment is being considered, and immediately after the Second Amendment is being considered, each of which reflect the understanding of the speaker that the amendment protects an individual right. What you don't have, what you don't find in the historical record, is a single example of any contemporary at the time at the Second Amendment was drafted referring to it as anything other than an individual right. Not one. Uh, throughout the end of the 1700s, throughout the 1800s, up to the early 1900s, the uh, right to bear arms was universally understood as an individual right. There's virtually no authority for the, for the state's right proposition during that era. So where did anyone get the idea that the Second Amendment is purely a state's right to a militia system? Might it be the wording of the amendment? The Second Amendment provides that the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Uh, the big dispute is over whether that means an individual right. 
Uh, other provisions in the Bill of Rights use the same term, the right of the people. Uh, for example, the First Amendment talks about the right of the people to peaceably assemble. The Fourth Amendment talks about the right of the people to be secure from uh, unreasonable searches and seizures. Nowhere in the, in the, in the Constitution is the, word, is the term the people used in a way that could possibly refer to uh, state governments. In the Tenth Amendment, uh, the states and the people are specifically distinguished. And at various points in the Constitution, the, the, the term the people uh, is used to refer perhaps to some subset of the population. So that the people, when the Constitution uses the term the people, it doesn't necessarily mean every human being who exists in the United States. It can be a subset of the population, but it's never used to refer to state governments. Um, the preface um, clearly expresses an end that the founders believed in, which was the protection of the militia. And so far as I'm concerned, what that means is even if today we don't agree that this general militia consisting of the able-bodied population is a good thing to have armed, we have hardwired into the Constitution an affirmation of its importance. That is, a well-regulated militia is essential to the security of a free state. So there's the end. A lot of people today, they don't agree with that end, but that end is in the Constitution. Then the question is, by what means is that end protected? There's lots of possibilities, lots of ways the founders might have tried to protect that end, but they chose one. They chose the protection of an individual right to keep and bear arms, thereby keeping the population armed, as a prereq which is a prerequisite to having an armed population ready to operate as a militia. The state's rights view is almost entirely a creature of the last hundred years, or less than the last hundred years, that uh, throughout all the time from the framing to the early 1900s, individual rights view was the orthodox, conventional, and unquestioned understanding. So where did the idea of a collective right originate? There had been a mention of a state's right position in an obscure 1842 Arkansas decision, State versus Buzzard, but that was the position of one judge only. Neither then nor later did the entire Arkansas court accept it, and it largely faded from memory. Then in 1905, a 53-year-old rancher named James Blacksley ran afoul of the law in Salina, Kansas. He was charged with possessing a gun while intoxicated in violation of a city ordinance. He was convicted and fined a dollar plus court cost. Blacksley got an attorney and appealed his case. It ultimately came before the Kansas Supreme Court. He argued that it violated his rights under the Kansas constitutional right to bear arms, and the government prosecuting the case said no it doesn't because there's various regulations that are allowed on the carrying of guns, and actually regulations on concealed carry had a very long history in American law, so the government had a plausible position. Nobody in the case argued that the Kansas right to arms in its state constitution is a nullity that it doesn't even exist for any practical purpose. That was something, however, which the Kansas Supreme Court uh, decided to invent without being asked to do so in this 1905 case. Now, Kansas has a constitutional right to bear arms, as does almost every other state. And this right to bear arms is contained in the section of the Kansas Constitution called Bill of Rights. Everything in the Bill of Rights is a right, and it belongs to individuals. Now, the rather notable thing about this dishonest decision in Selina v. Blakesley was the Kansas Supreme Court couldn't cite any authority for its position. They cited two main authorities for their theory. The first one was a very famous criminal law treatise by a guy named Joel Bishop on criminal law. But what they did was, was pull a few words of his out of context, is quite clearly uh, examining Bishop's text in full, shows that he believed the Second Amendment was an individual right. And then the other thing they did was pull out a 1896 uh, Massachusetts case in which the Massachusetts court interpreting their state constitution uh, said that even though you have a right to arms, the government can prohibit mass armed parades in public without a permit. Now, saying that there's no right to have a big armed parade in public without getting a permit from the government is hardly the same as saying you have no right at all to possess a gun in your own house under any circumstances. And yet that's what the Kansas Supreme Court dishonestly cited the Massachusetts Murphy decision to mean. So other than those two fraudulent citations, the Kansas Supreme Court had no authority for its decision in Selena. And decades later, the Kansas Supreme Court, to its authority, to, to its credit,
uh, didn't formally overrule Selena and say it was wrongly decided, but they, in essence, did that because they returned to treating the Kansas right to arms as an individual right belonging to individual Kansans. The problems don't end with the historical. Federal law still defines all men of military age and some women as the unorganized militia of the United States. Most state laws track this, and in fact, some states go farther and include all women of military age as well. Even a right restricted to militiamen, as defined by current law, would still be a broad right. To get around this, some advocates of a collective right claim that it only protects the state's right to control its National Guard. That just creates more problems. For one thing, the National Guard didn't legally exist at the time the Second Amendment was being drafted. In fact, the National Guard was created by a 1903 law, which was expanded in 1933. A look at the congressional debates show that both the supporters and the opponents of the system indicated they did not understand the National Guard to be the militia, but only part of the militia. That is the part which had volunteered for special federal duty. Under those laws, the militia remained all males of military age, with the Guard merely the organized part of it. The framers wouldn't have considered the National Guard a militia at all. Uh, the framers didn't like standing armies because they were not the whole citizenry. They were rather a small body of citizens uh, with exceptional loyalty to the king. In the same way, the framers would have regarded uh, the National Guard as what they called a select militia, which they regarded as little better than a standing army. The virtue of the militia was that it embodied the citizenry as a whole, and smaller subsets, like the National Guard, just don't possess that virtue. But if the collective rights view was unknown to the framers and invented by a state court a century later, why does anyone even speak of it? The story begins with the Supreme Court opinion that, paradoxically, rejected it. In 1934, Congress enacted the National Firearms Act, which essentially required registration of machine guns, sawed-off shotguns, and a few other arms. Jack Miller, a Native American member of a predominantly Irish bootlegging gang, was caught with an unregistered sawed-off shotgun and was indicted. His attorney moved to dismiss the indictment. The district judge, um, who had this wonderful name, Hartsill Ragon, uh, in Arkansas, quashed the indictment because, uh, in his opinion, and the opinion is very short, uh, the National Firearms Act violated the Second Amendment. Using a procedure which then existed, the government appealed Miller's case directly to the U.S. Supreme Court. When we checked in the clerk's archives, we found several interesting anomalies. For one thing, Miller's attorney had been given almost no time to prepare a brief or show up for oral argument. As a result, he did neither. In fact, he sent a telegram suggesting that the court consider the case submitted based on the government's brief. The government uh, was the only party that filed a brief. It was the only party that appeared at oral argument. So the court really got uh, only one side. In the Supreme Court's opinion, which is very short, the court said a couple of things. The court said that the Second Amendment has to be interpreted uh, in a way that makes possible the continuation and efficacy of the militia. They had historical uh, citations to literature which made clear that the militia at the time of the framing was comprised of all able-bodied uh, free males uh, in the community who were expected to show up with their own uh, weapons. In fact, the National Guard was nowhere mentioned uh, in the Miller opinion. What the, and the, the court then said that it was presented with no evidence and could therefore not take judicial notice of the fact that the particular kind of weapon, the sawed-off shotgun for which Miller and Layton were indicted uh, for possessing, was the kind of weapon that would be of use to uh, the militia. So the Supreme Court found in favor of an individual right, although it suggested that a person had to prove that the arms were suited for militia use. But when it did this, was the court aware of the Kansas Supreme Court's claim that the amendment only protected a National Guard-type unit? Government put forth in its argument to the Supreme Court in Miller in 1939 a version of the so-called collective rights argument. Most of the government's brief is devoted to saying the Second Amendment only protects the right of state militias to be armed. Uh, only a very small portion of their 
brief was devoted to making the argument that whatever the Second Amendment protects, it doesn't protect the right to possess a sawed-off shotgun. And the court rejected, or at least it didn't adopt, that collective rights position that was in the government's brief. And one has a hard time believing that it's it's something they weren't aware of. After all, they only had one brief in the entire case to read. Uh, the Supreme Court uh, never adopted the collective rights theory in the uh, in the Miller case, but later on, lots of federal courts adopted the habit of claiming that the Supreme Court had. What we have is the test in Miller taken by the court in cases, uh, Circuit Court of Appeals, uh, and the court finds the test in Miller unsatisfactory. The primary reason they find the court, uh, the test in Miller unsatisfactory is that it would, in the view of the Circuit Court, the Miller test would protect too many firearms. That is, uh, if the test is simply, could the firearm be uh, of some utility in uh, combat? Could the firearm be of some utility in the process of, of pursuing the uh, goals of the well-regulated militia? Um, the court answers yes, and the court essentially acknowledges that a broad range of firearms might have some significant utility uh, for those purposes, and that the only things that might be excluded are uh, the you know the arcane cap and ball rifle or the arcane flintlock. Uh, the court finds that as a policy matter unsatisfactory, and essentially abandons the Miller test. Well. That decision by the circuit court turns out to be the basis on which a number of the lower federal court decisions over the next 60 years uh, is grounded. And it's interesting because if you go through the um, courts of appeals opinions carefully, there's really no analysis of Miller. Uh, it just achieved the status of received wisdom. And sometimes they'll cite pages uh, to Miller uh, where this holding is supposedly uh, located, and if you go back and read Miller carefully, you see that there's nothing of the sort in the Miller opinion. Only recently with the Fifth Circuit decision in the Emerson case, and we found some judges really being willing to uh, focus very closely on all of the evidence and concluding that the right is an individual right. So now that the Fifth Circuit has held for an individual right and other circuits for states' right, now it may be that the Supreme Court will feel uh, compelled in the next several years to consider the issue because now it sees the split between the circuits, this disagreement among lower federal courts that it will have to resolve on a national basis. But when we speak of the Second Amendment, we are really only discussing one textual source of the American right to arms. The other source is a much later 14th Amendment derived from the Afro-American experience. In early America, it must be understood the right to arms, like rights to free speech and association, did not apply to everyone. There were the slave codes. And under those codes, a person who was a slave or an African-American was prohibited possession of any kind of weapon, including firearms. As time went on, uh, you had slave revolts like that of Nat Turner and others, and a, a beefing up of the slave code provisions, including those which uh, deprived African-American people of arms. The slave codes played a major role in what is probably the most controversial decision of the Supreme Court, and certainly the only one that started a war. The story begins with an elderly slave known as Dred Scott, or perhaps it begins with Mrs. Scott, whom some historians suggest came up with the idea. Their legal theory was simple. By the Missouri Compromise and later Congressional Compromises, certain states and territories could allow slavery, whereas in others it was illegal. Starting Missouri, a slave state, Scott's master had taken him to Illinois, a free state, and then in Wisconsin, a free territory, before returning to Missouri. Scott argued that by living for years in areas where slavery was illegal, he'd become free. The fact that he had later returned to a slave state could not undo his freedom. Dred Scott's lawsuit began with a simple X on a civil complaint, alleging that he and his family were now free. It wound up in federal court under what is known as diversity jurisdiction, where federal courts can resolve suits between citizens of different states. It was eventually appealed to the United States Supreme Court. Here lies the man who kicked over the hornet's nest, Roger Brooke Taney, fourth Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court. In his Dred Scott opinion, Taney made two rulings. The first was that the Missouri Compromise was unconstitutional. Slaves were man's property and he was free to take them wherever he pleased, including into a free state or a free territory. That made compromise impossible and brought on the Civil War. 
But secondly, Taney ruled that the court had no jurisdiction over Dred Scott's suit anyway. Scott had sued under what's called diversity jurisdiction, where a federal court can settle a suit between residents or citizens of two different states. But, Taney ruled, Dred Scott was not a citizen of the state or of the United States, nor was any free black. He reasoned that the framers could not have intended to give free blacks the rights, the privileges and immunities, as he called them, of citizenship. And he listed what those rights would be, what they would have if they were indeed citizens of the United States. The U.S. Supreme Court held that African Americans could not be considered citizens, they could not be considered as having the rights of citizens of the United States. And what were those rights? In the Supreme Court opinion, the statement is made that if African Americans were citizens or had the rights of citizens, then they could have political meetings, they could have the right of free speech, and they could keep and carry arms wherever they went. The court's decision had some unintended consequences, beginning with the Civil War. That in turn led not only to the abolition of slavery, but also to the enlistment and arming of black troops. Around 200,000 black Americans served in the Civil War, some in U.S. colored troop regiments and others in state units such as the 54th Massachusetts. Many did not come home. Those that did came home with their muskets and their hopes, which we found those to take away. Slavery was abolished by the 13th Amendment when the, the southern states were defeated, however, they reenacted the slave codes, they called them the Black Codes, and under the Black Codes you had the same punishments for keeping and bearing arms, basically 39 lashes with a whip, and you have the attempt by the southern states to enforce these Black Codes through the organized militias. Once the Freedmen and Union veterans were disarmed, they weren't protected against the reign of terror that followed, as mass men assassinated any who dared to speak out. Congress was outraged. The 39th Congress met late 1865, early 1866, and again and again you see members of Congress decrying these slave code, um, uh, reenacted as black code provisions, specifically pointing out that it was inconsistent with the abolition of slavery that black people in the southern states were being disarmed. And you have repeated complaints about the behavior of the southern militia forces. They would break into the, the cabins of freed slaves, searching for arms, robbing them, and committing other outrages. At, at the same time, you have um, black organizations in the south organizing themselves and arguing that they have a right to keep and bear arms, they have a right to free speech and whatnot. And one of these conventions of blacks uh, from which met in South Carolina was publicized by Senator Charles Sumner early in the 39th Congress. And he, he read off the rights of a freedman. And one of those rights was that the inhabitants, including the, the freedmen, the newly freed slaves, had a right to keep and bear arms. Now, how did they, how did the members of the 39th Congress through legislation and the 14th Amendment protect the right to keep and bear arms? In, in the first place, the Civil Rights Act, which was S-60, Senate Bill 60, Freedmen's Bureau Act, S-61, were um, proposed side by side and they provided respectively as follows. The Civil Rights Act of 1866 was to apply in those areas where law and order was restored in the southern states and the courts were functioning. And part of that act provided that black people had the same rights as white people. The Freedmen's Bureau Act had similar language and as part of that language, however, an explanatory clause was inserted as a floor amendment at one point in its legislative history such that it read that the right, um, the rights of person and property included the constitutional right to bear arms. And so there you had in the Freedmen's Bureau Bill a declaration that these rights of personal security and personal liberty included the constitutional right to bear arms. No other Bill of Rights Freedom got that status in that legislation or any other legislation in the Reconstruction Congress. But the Freedmen's Bureau Act was declared unconstitutional by lower courts. Nothing in the Constitution required the states to observe the Federal Bill of Rights or gave Congress power to force them to do so. 
The Bill of Rights was written to constrain the federal government. Uh, the framers uh, uh, understood that states had their own state constitutions, most of which had their own state bills of rights, uh, and that if a state was restricting your speech or searching you or or uh, restricting your gun ownership, uh, that would be a matter uh, to sue over in state court under the state constitution. In fact, quite a few right to bear arms cases throughout the 1800s were under the state constitution. Congress responded by proposing what became the 14th Amendment, requiring states to observe the privileges and immunities of U.S. citizenship, and also forbidding them to deprive persons of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. It then passed the Enforcement Act, making it illegal for anyone to deprive a person of their constitutional rights while acting under color of state law. Looking at the debates at the time, it's, it's fairly evident that both the, the detractors of, of the 14th Amendment and its advocates uh, considered the impact of the 14th Amendment to be to grant to uh, essentially freed slaves the privileges and immunities of American citizens. That includes the Second Amendment and all the provisions of, of the Bill of Rights. Uh, and it was deemed to be quite controversial at the time. Uh, was some of the best evidence that we have uh, suggesting that the Privileges and Immunities Clause was intended to extend the Bill of Rights to free slaves is uh, the controversy between the advocates and the detractors of the 14th Amendment uh, regarding whether it was good policy or not to have uh, the freemen with access to not only the right to assemble peaceably in things that were granted under the First Amendment, but also the right to keep and bear arms wherever they went. But the congressional celebrations were premature. While Congress and the people can adopt a constitutional amendment, the courts can say what it means, and sometimes they take liberties with it. Starting with what are known as the slaughterhouse cases, the Supreme Court made it clear that it considered the idea of applying the Federal Bill of Rights to the states too revolutionary for its taste. It set out to find a way around the Privileges and Immunities Clause. The court's attack was based on a word game. The clause referred to the privileges and immunities of U.S. citizenship, and the court proclaimed federal privileges and immunities must be something other than the privileges and immunities of state citizenship. The privileges of U.S. citizenship must mean only those legal rights that did not exist before there was a U.S. government. The court then proclaimed that freedom of speech and similar things were natural rights existing in all free societies, whether written down or not. Hence, they could not be privileges that came into being only when the national government was created, and thus they were not privileges and immunities of U.S. citizenship. Thus, the court argued that the very fact that a right was fundamental, essential to any free government, proved that it wasn't protected under the Privileges and Immunities Clause, and states could disregard it. The Supreme Court took the position that the most fundamental rights antedated the Constitution, were found by the federal government and the state governments in place, and that they had a mysteriously originated obligation to respect those fundamental rights that wasn't in the Constitution or the 14th Amendment. It was just out there somewhere. And as people found out uh, when they began seeking to enforce those rights, rights that are out there somewhere don't exist. The court's attack came to a head in the case of United States v. Cruikshank. William Cruikshank was a sheriff who'd led a mob in the most lethal racial violence in our nation's history. The mob burned a courthouse occupied by freedmen, captured and disarmed them, and then murdered approximately a hundred of them. Cruikshank was convicted for depriving the victims of their rights to assemble, to keep and bear arms, and against being murdered by a state employee. The Supreme Court reversed his conviction, holding that rights to assemble, to have arms, and to live were rights under all free governments, may have been recognized by the U.S. Constitution, but were not created by it, and thus were not privileges and immunities of U.S. citizenship. The decision was clear-cut. First, it looked at um, the right to assemble. And it referred to that right as a traditional privilege and immunity which exists in any free society. And then it goes on to say, in this opinion, the right to keep and bear arms is of the same nature. This right was not created by the Constitution because it antedated the Constitution. It existed prior to the enactment of the Constitution, just like the right under the First Amendment to free assembly. And so that's a right that the uh, you have to look for justice when that right is violated by private individuals to your state and local authorities. 
1876 is a significant year. It's the year that Reconstruction basically ended. The Supreme Court wasn't going to protect the rights of freedmen. The federal government was no longer going to protect those rights. And then we go into the Jim Crow era and into the area in which blacks were disenfranchised again and, and subjected to, at least in an informal sense, uh, to violation of their right to keep and bear arms and to other rights. The best or worst memorial of this regrettable period of history is found in our first feature-length film, D.W. Griffith's Birth of a Nation. The disclaimer that Griffith ran at the beginning of the film was belied by the film's advertising posters, which reflected its real content. In his film, the Ku Klux Klan are the heroes and the freedmen are the villains. The one virtue of this appalling film is its historical accuracy. Initially, the Klan must stay underground, raiding only at night. But the freedmen fight back, resisting and ambushing the Klan. The freedmen's success, however, proves temporary. The leaders of the Klan hit upon a simple response, and Griffith invented the Burning Cross as a small rallying point for the Klansmen who carry out the orders. The disarming of the freedmen proves a success for the Klan, and it need no longer remain underground. Isolated assassinations are replaced by shows of massed force. The last is used to ensure that the freedmen are stripped of all remaining political rights. The, the film depicts the, uh, one of, one of the, you know, the most horrible uh, uh, periods in, in American history. Uh, depicts the, um, s the situation that, or depicts a situation where individuals could not rely on the state, where the state was uh, in various jurisdictions in, in cooperation with essentially a domestic terrorist organization. Uh, uh, the, the film prompts the resurgence of uh, the, that, that very organization, uh, an organization that, that begins um, it's it's recruiting efforts uh, in, in earnest uh, as, as the film becomes popular and uh, develops a membership in the millions. When the civil rights struggle renewed in the 1950s and 60s, the process had to be reversed. That civil rights workers packed arms and defended themselves remains an untold story of the era. How widespread was armament among civil rights workers? Well, the morning that I came in to my office and told my story about having been followed the night before, uh, you know, everyone in the chorus just said you fool why don't you have a gun and i said well do you and the answer from everyone from the secretary to the manager of the unit was of course there are people trying to kill us <laughs> uh, and one of my fellow employees said here take this one i have another in the car as a civil rights worker in the South in the early 1960s, I carried guns for my own protection and for the protection of my clients. Um, I have no idea whether carry was legal or illegal in North Carolina at that time. I suspect, based on what I know now, that it probably wasn't. But there were trying people out there trying to kill me. <laughs> and I wasn't going to go into a dam. Uh, and be discovered by the FBI months later. Uh, you know, if they were going to, to take me, they were going to have a fight on their hands. Uh, I actually had to use it in two separate occasions. Uh, the same sort of thing. People would pull up, uh, follow the vehicle, get very close. Uh, at this point, they knew who I was. Uh, and, uh, you know, what you, you take your gun out, you hold it up, in the headlights in front of the rear view mirror and you wave it back and forth. And amazing things happen. Their headlights dim. Their car backs off from yours. Uh, and you're able to drive away. Uh, why? Because, you know, thugs don't like to run into people who are going to cause them any problems. On various occasions, uh, a bunch of us would sit in or around the house of uh, some activist who had been subject to Klan death threats, uh, we would sit there with our guns and nothing happened. Well, I think if, if you know, if you ask um, the people who were actually doing it in the South, uh, they would all tell you that they were armed, uh, 
most of them would tell you that they were armed at all times everywhere they went. Uh, because, you know, they were trying to kill us. The largest civil rights self-defense organization was the Deacons for Self-Defense, which had hundreds of members in several states. The civil rights movement in the South, which ultimately prevailed, would almost certainly have been snuffed if it had not been for armed resistance and it was actually embodied in the deacons for defense men some of whom had actually been deacons leaders in their churches uh, and other men who had been screened and found to be men of uh, even temper and character uh, who were brought into this movement to defend civil rights workers when the clan uh, continued to attack uh, civil rights uh, movements, um, uh, marches, sit-ins, or things like that, uh, when they would uh, try to torch uh, the cross in somebody's front yard, uh, they found armed resistance. And uh, the long and the short of it was, within months, they decided that um, that was not a good idea. Roy Innes, president of the Congress on Racial Equality, or CORE, is also a director of the NRA. He recalls how core members were protected by the deacons. The deacons for self-defense were courageous young men who respected the nonviolent posture of the core demonstrators, the core civil rights workers. Uh, being aware of the uh, attacks, the violence that was uh, forced onto them, the deacons for defense decided that while they're not committed to the nonviolent protests of the core and other civil rights uh, activists and workers, that they could do a service to protect those people. There, there is a, another example of people defending themselves uh, in the period of the civil rights revolution of the 50s and 60s. Uh, a fellow named Robert Williams in North Carolina, a former member of the NAACP, broke away from the NAACP and uh, organized a group of young men to defend themselves against uh, rabid racists. Robert Williams was a civil rights organizer uh, in the Carolinas uh, and he produced a, uh, a black, an all black, or virtually all black chapter of the NRA, uh, dedicated to defending civil rights uh, workers who were menaced by uh, Klansmen. He wrote a uh, book about this, uh, which was published I guess in the 1960s, that's when I read it. Williams' book explains how his NAACP chapter affiliated with the NRA and what resulted. Luther Hodges was governor at the time. We first appealed to him. He took sides with the Klan. Then we appealed to President Eisenhower, but we never received a reply to our telegrams. There was no response at all from Washington. So we started arming ourselves. I wrote to the National Rifle Association in Washington, which encourages veterans to keep in shape to defend their native land, and I asked for a charter, which we got. In a year, we had 60 members. We had bought some guns, too, in stores, and later a church in the north raised money and got us better rifles. The Klan discovered we were arming and guarding our community. In the summer of 1957, they made one big attempt to stop us. An armed motorcade attacked Dr. Perry's house, which is situated on the outskirts of the colored community. We shot it out with the Klan and repelled their attack, and the Klan didn't have much stomach for this type of fight. They stopped raiding our community. The following year, the same Klan unit organized a cross-burning aimed at the Lumbee Indian tribe of North Carolina, some of whose members were dating or marrying non-Indians. The president of Lumbee VFW organized a response. The rally was illuminated by a single light, and in the darkness beyond its reach, around 500 armed Lumbees encircled the rally. A shot extinguished the light bulb, and the Lumbees rushed in, shouting and firing into the air. The Klansmen fled in terror, and the Lumbee captured and burned their robes. The event captured publicity across the nation. State authorities convicted the Klan leader of incitement to riot, and he spent two years in prison. His organization never recovered from the blows dealt it by Robert William and the Lumbees. <laughs> 
The 14th Amendment approach for an individual right to arms has attracted even more scholarly interest than the traditional Second Amendment approach. In 2003, the American Enterprise Institute hosted a symposium on the right to arms. Among the speakers were Professor Robert Cottrell of George Washington University Law School, Professor Sanford Levinson of the University of Texas School of Law, and Professor Akhil Amar of Yale Law School, probably our greatest living expert on the 14th Amendment. The panel began with the Second Amendment, but the 14th Amendment approach quickly hijacked the discussion. What is meant by the people? I think we have to look to the rest of the Bill of Rights. The rest of the Bill of Rights speaks of the right of the people to peaceably assemble and petition in the First Amendment. Uh, the Fourth speaks of the right of the people's security in their homes. The Ninth speaks of retention uh, of other rights. Are we really to believe that Madison and his colleagues meant something else by the people with the Second Amendment? It's possible, highly unlikely, but possible. But it's interesting that the advocates of the collective rights view have failed to come up, and believe me, they have looked assiduously, they have failed to come up with any contemporary statement supporting the notion that the contemporaries of, uh, the, that the people at the time, that anybody at the time read uh, the people differently in the Second Amendment from the way they read them in the other amendments. Um, when I think about it, think about the jury. The voters are the jurors, the jurors are the voters, it's organized locally as our militias and and um, and the jury can be a grand jury as well, which helps in the prosecution of laws. Um, and um, the posse comitatus is just kind of an extension of that, and the militia is is linked to that. What are what are militias? They're just jurors with guns in their hands. But it's the it's people, the citizenry, not Hessians, not foreigners, um, not on a volunteer basis, not individualistic, not quite guns in homes um, at the core, but a, a, a collective localist structure. Um, it's certainly, I think, clear that if we look at the debates over the 14th Amendment, there's an intention through the Privileges or Immunities Clause to make the Bill of Rights, and particularly the First and Second Amendments, applicable to the states. I think it's very important to mention the Dred Scott case, because I think the Dred Scott case, at one and the same time, is the most despicable case in our history, but also one of the most genuinely interesting and informative about the development of American popular legal norms. The reason blacks could not be citizens, not to put too fine a point on it, is because citizenship really mattered. It brought with it a whole bunch of rights. And one of these rights, according to Chief Justice Taney, was the right, quote, to keep and carry arms wherever they went, unquote. Now fast forward to the Reconstruction. Now this um, uh, central standing army, of which there was so much anxiety at the founding, well, it's beginning to look a little bit better after Gettysburg and Vicksburg and, and these local militias, well, we have some more doubts about whether they really protect liberty or not. They just wage, not to put too fine a point on it, treason against Mr. Lincoln and his, his government, which is where Dr. Goldwood uh, ended. And in this story, now, uh, so our national epic gets rewritten with, um, in, and uh, we have a different and more celebratory view of the national army. Um, so now it's not, they're not them, they're us. They're looking for a few good men. It's, it's Tom Hanks and a multiracial, multicultural band of, of brothers in, in, in World War II. That's a different national narrative than anxiety about this central standing army that can't be authorized more than two years at a time. And uh, the local militias are disfavored and more individualistic view of the right to keep in arms. The key language here is the language of the 14th Amendment. No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States. What are those privileges and immunities? Now, that's individualistic privilege. It's a little privacy. It's less personal about people, political, more individualistic. Among the privileges and immunities of individuals, of individual citizens, women as well as men, blacks as well as whites, even though they're not yet voting, 
is the right to have a gun in your home for self-protection. This is especially important because blacks cannot trust local uh, police forces to protect them from private violence, from Klansmen. So founding vision, when arms are outlawed, only the central government will have arms. Reconstruction vision, when our guns are outlawed, only the Klan will have guns. And Tawny was not simply an outlier. The Republican Party platform of 1856 was the first platform to refer uh, to, quote, the right of the people to keep and bear arms, the Second Amendment. But they, this isn't raised within the right of a well-regulated militia, etc., but rather you have an insurgent political party claiming that the right of the people to keep and bear arms was not being adequately protected, and if they were brought into power, that would do so. Interestingly enough, the 1864 Democratic Party platform also referred to, quote, interference with and denial of the right of the people to bear arms in their defense, unquote. Let me read you, actually, the, the sentence from uh, the Key Civil Rights Act of, of 1866. This is the companion statute to the 14th Amendment. It's a companion to the Freedmen's Bureau Bill, and it affirms um, uh, uh, laws concerning personal liberty, personal security, and the enjoyment of property, real and personal, including the constitutional right to bear arms. So now bear arms here is not being read in a paradigmatically military way, but a private way. Individuals need this um, uh, um, um, uh, 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 right uh, in, the, in their homes to, uh, to protect themselves. And um, the NRA is formed after the Civil War. Um, and it's not quite as self-conscious, I think, as it should be, of the Reconstruction story as uh, influencing its worldview about rights in general and gun rights in particular. Uh, let me just conclude by saying I think it's important to, to look at the text through the eyes of the historical actors. Uh, the text, it seems to me, is not really ambiguous, and indeed, almost nobody saw any ambiguity or any collective right in the Second Amendment, it's curious enough, until the 1960s and until the national gun control movement. Uh, it, it was a view that was virtually unknown before the 1960s. But even if you say that the text is arguably ambiguous, and I don't think it is, why do all the existing sources point um, to the fact that Americans of the late 18th century, of uh, the antebellum era, and the Reconstruction period, and indeed beyond, all read uh, the Second Amendment in individual terms? Where is the evidence that anybody until the 20th century read it the other way? So we have two textual sources for the American right to arms, the Second Amendment arising out of early English law and the colonial experience, and the Fourteenth Amendment arising out of the Afro-American experience after the Civil War. But I suppose we might still ask, uh, what value has the right to arms in a world in which there are no more redcoats and rather few Klansmen? When you have an armed civilian population, a government that's tempted to engage in the kind of serious oppression that would uh, stimulate armed resistance is less likely to do so than if the population is completely disarmed. Guns are a very, very effective and successful means of preventing genocide, uh, which is a far greater danger than uh, crime. Uh, across the entire 20th century, uh, the entire world during the 20th century, approximately 5 million people were murdered by criminals. 261 million people were murdered in genocides. And of course, the great genocide of uh, Rwanda, where Hutu uh, militias uh, were able to rampage and just murdered Tutsis. And there'll be more of that as long as we have this crazy uh, program of gun prohibition. There'll be more of that. Where people are able to defend themselves and protect their homes, you don't get genocide.
and indeed you're beginning to see among scholars of genocide and international law some talk that there might be an international right to be armed actually uh, a view that is uh, in contradistinction to the conventional wisdom at the UN these days uh, but one that's beginning to gather some support based on experience the principal animating purpose of the Second Amendment was to prevent the government from the federal, the new federal government, from adopting disarmament schemes that would make it easier for the government to oppress the people. Protecting the right of the people to defend itself against oppression, however, is a broader concept and was for them a broader concept than merely protecting the people from governmental oppression. There's another kind of oppression, closely related, uh, in the minds of the framers and going back at least as far as Blackstone, in which the people can be oppressed because the government doesn't protect them from oppression. Now these other sources of oppression, sources other than the government, at, at the time of the framing might have included marauding Indians, but it certainly would have included violent criminals as well. And when the government disarms the, po the civilian population, it not only makes the population more vulnerable to oppression by the government, but it also makes them vulnerable to oppression from criminals from whom the government does not adequately protect them. How often do Americans defend themselves with guns? It was time for a trip to Florida State University where criminology professor Gary Kleck has undertaken the most extensive studies of the subject. We did a survey in uh, 1994 asking about their experiences in the previous year, 1993. We did this by calling people up by telephone. We contacted nearly 5,000 people who completed interviews with us. We would only count um, an experience as being a defense of gun use if the victim actually did something with the gun. They had to at minimum threaten the criminal with a gun rather than just being in possession of the gun at the time. Um, they had to have an actual confrontation with the offender. Our survey in 1993 estimated that there were about two and a half million defensive gun uses that year in the United States. And at the same time, the National Crime Victimization Survey, which is a federal government survey um, conducted by the Census Bureau, indicated there were about 800,000 crimes committed by criminals armed with guns. Uh, which meant that there were about three times as many defensive uses of guns by crime victims as there were crimes committed by offenders who were armed with guns at the time. It would be fair to say best available evidence indicated about three times as many defensive gun uses as offensive uses by criminals. Um, we can't really say how many of the defensive gun uses saved a life. We only know what people told us when we asked them do you think this defensive use might have saved a life? How likely is it you think somebody would have died had you not used it? And roughly one out of six victims who used a gun defensively believe that it was certain or almost certain that somebody would have died had they not used the gun for self-protection. It's strictly a subjective assessment. We have no idea how many of those people were accurate in that perception. Maybe they just in their minds exaggerated how threatening a situation it was. Uh, but that implies out of two and a half million estimated defensive gun users, maybe around 400,000 would, if you asked them, claim that they saved a life. How many of those 400,000 are accurate in thinking so? We can't know, but the point is, if even a tenth of them believed who believed they saved a life actually did so, that would have meant 40,000 lives saved through defensive gun use. And this was in a year in which you know, probably no more than about 10 to 12,000 people were murdered by offenders with guns. So it, it's certainly reasonable that the number of lives saved through defensive gun use was larger than the number taken uh, through criminal use. Certainly guns in the hands of criminals contribute to making the homicide rate higher. But victims having guns contribute to making the homicide rate lower. And the, as far as we can tell, best estimates indicate the two effects cancel each other out. Uh, the policy significance of this is 
we ought to keep guns away from the bad guys, and we ought to let the good guys, whose only involvement in crime will be as victims, uh, continue to have them. But what about the idea that the police are there to protect you? We asked David Kopel, a former prosecutor. What the courts say again and again and again is you can sue the government because uh, it failed to protect you, but you're not going to win anything. The government has no legally enforceable duty to protect the public. The best or worst illustration of this point came in the District of Columbia's appeals court decision in Warren v. D.C. In March 1975, three women were living in a townhouse in Washington, D.C. Under D.C. law at the time, they were forbidden to own not only handguns, but mace, pepper spray, or other non-lethal self-defense tools. Late one night, a pair of thugs broke in and began beating and raping the woman who lived downstairs. Upstairs, the other women called 911 and were told police were being sent. As the court later acknowledged, the 911 dispatcher only reported a domestic disturbance at the address. The squad car that responded saw no disturbance, checked the door, and left. The women upstairs called 911 again and were again told help was on the way. This time, the dispatcher didn't even bother sending out a radio call. Believing their friend was dying, the women upstairs called down that the police were on the way. Instead of fleeing, the thugs grabbed them too, and, as the court noted with restraint, subjected the three women to a 14-hour nightmare of rape, beatings, and abuse. The women sued the District of Columbia and lost. The D.C. Court of Appeals ruled that the city had no legal duty to protect its citizens. Even when its employees had promised that help was on the way and then refused to send it. Under the ruling, the D.C. government was free to refuse to protect its citizens, even as it was free to ensure that they could not defend themselves either. All those police chiefs and mayors and so on who say... Uh, you don't need a gun, just rely on us. Uh, well, that's what they say for public consumption. But when somebody is raped because they called 911 and nobody responded, uh, or robbed or murdered, and the family sues the police, the police come forward with the statutes that exist in every state which say the police are not responsible for protecting people. The insanity of this is that the D.C. government has passed laws which prohibits an individual from protecting themselves. But yet, as this court case points out, they have no legal obligation to come to your aid either. One of the interesting things about the gun control debate is that in a way it's sort of a litmus test for what people think about uh, their fellow citizens in general. Uh, my own sense is that uh, Americans uh, tend to respond well to crises and generally can be trusted to try to do the right thing. And we saw some uh, excellent examples of that uh, in the aftermath of the 9-11 attacks, for example, where although it got only a little bit of media attention, uh, people spontaneously organized themselves and evacuated over a million people from Lower Manhattan by boat. Uh, some people have called it the American Dunkirk. Uh, it was orderly. People uh, didn't push, didn't shove, didn't throw the women and children aside to jump in the boats first or anything. Uh, and that actually is typical for how people respond in a crisis. Uh, in movies, people stampede and panic because that makes for a more dramatic movie. But in real life, people generally are fairly responsible. Uh, the same thing's true with responses to crime. My most recent published research uh, relevant to defense of gun use is uh, an article published in uh, the professional journal Criminology in the November 2004 issue. And it's it addressed to the topic of defense of gun use effectiveness. It's not how often it occurs, it's is it effective and how effective is it compared to other things that crime victims might do to protect themselves. And that research indicates the most effective method of self-protection crime victims have, the one that produces the lowest rate of injury and property loss is defensive gun use. It's more effective than defensive actions without weapons that are forceful but without a weapon. It's more effective than 
armed self-protection that doesn't involve a gun, it involves, say, a knife or some other weapon, it's more effective than uh, doing nothing at all, non-resistance. So, of all the things that crime victims can do, on average, the one that produces the lowest rate of injury to victims and the lowest rate of property loss um, is defensive gun use. If a thug sees a woman walking across a dark parking lot at night, I want him to be worried, wondering if that woman owns a firearm and if she knows how to use it. The founding fathers and the philosophers whom they uh, were influenced by regarded self-defense as the most important uh, civil right or human right, as they would have put it, uh, and believed that the right to self-defense included a right to arms and that any government which sought to d disarm its people did so for evil purposes uh, and was an evil government. That's where the Second Amendment comes from. Well, I think the Second Amendment is important for a number of reasons. It's first and foremost important because it gives, it provides, it protects the means by which individuals can defend themselves, both personally and collectively. And the right of self-defense is one of the most fundamental of the natural rights or the rights, the background rights that people have. Second Amendment protects our means of doing that. So that is one reason why it's extremely important. It's also important because any interpretive methodology that lets you disparage the Second Amendment into meaninglessness, which is basically the situation that we are currently in legally, um, allows you to disparage any of the other liberties that are protected in the Bill of Rights. Uh, the, if, you can do to the, if you can do to an explicit right what's been done to the Second Amendment by what used to be the scholarly consensus, then you can do that to any liberty, and in effect that means you've eliminated the Constitution as a constraint on governmental abuses. So that makes it very dangerous. and. Even people who don't care about gun rights, and there's many of those around, should care about seeing that the Second Amendment is protected because by protecting the rights that they don't agree with, they are more likely to see the rights they do agree with protected from people who don't agree with them. All in all, the rediscovery of the Second Amendment and its purposes took about 30 years. The law school where I started my journey is now a construction site. Looking back at the old photos, Don Cates now has gray hair, so does Steve Halbrook. I have a little enough hair at all. Dave Kaplan isn't with us anymore. He passed on a while ago. It's been a long journey. Thanks for letting me share it with you. legal historian Leonard Levy's book on the same subject. Levy's book criticized Professor Larry Tribe's textbook, American Constitutional Law, 
for not acknowledging the growing evidence of an individual right to arms. While Levy's book was still at the presses, Professor Tribe brought out a new edition of his textbook, accepting that very evidence. What caused the sudden turnaround? One article. The recent boom in Second Amendment scholarship that has led most scholars to conclude that it protects an individual right really did begin with the work of Don Cates in the Michigan Law Review. Uh, I'm a good friend of Sandy Levinson's, and I know that he was influenced by that article. Um, and then many of us were inter- influenced by Sandy. So, you know, that's what kind of got the snowball going down the hill. And it's just gathered more and more steam as it has. But it is pretty impressive that uh, top scholars, top liberal constitutional scholars like Professor Sandy Levinson at the University of Texas writing the Yale Law Journal, uh, Duke Law Professor Bill Van Alstyne, uh, really very big names have made it quite clear uh, that their research uh, uh, reveals that this is an individual, a Second Amendment that secures an individual right. We know an awful lot more about the Second Amendment now than we did before. In England, at least uh, at the beginning, uh, there was no royal army. The king was dependent upon the citizen militia. Uh, They had laws that essentially required every Englishman to be armed. Uh, Everyone was required to own arms. Everyone was required to show up at various times with those arms. Uh, They were required to have arms that were suitable for their condition. So that if you were a duke, uh, you might have to have a charger and a full set of armor. Whereas a uh, poor villain who lived on 10 acres uh, could get by with having a pike or a longbow. Henry VIII went farther and lowered the age requirement. Now starting at age seven, fathers were required to provide their sons with bows and arrows and see that they constantly practice shooting with them. So I started reading both about uh, gun control policy and constitutional law just because it was interesting. And I found quite to my surprise that in fact the individual rights view uh, really is historically uh, by, all, by all means the best attested one. In the 1960s I carried a gun as a civil rights worker. Uh, in 1975 I became a law professor and I began researching uh, issues involving uh, gun ownership, self-defense, so on. I was a young lawyer living alone in the Hollywood Hills, and somebody tried to break into my house in the middle of the night. That man didn't get into my house, but it was a lesson that stayed with me for the rest of my life. I went out, I went to a gun store, eventually bought a firearm and learned how to use it safely and responsibly. I'm Dave Hardy, and I'll be your host today. My own search for the meaning of the Second Amendment began here, at what was in the 1970s the College of Law and headquarters of the Arizona Law Review. I was writing an article for the review, and my editor suggested I add a segment on the meaning of the Second Amendment. I told him I didn't think there was much to be said. I was wrong, but that was the 1970s. In, in from uh, about 1930 till about 1970, there was hardly any legal scholarship on, on the Second Amendment. Uh, perhaps a dozen articles that really addressed the Second Amendment uh, in, in any kind of detail at all, and, and not even very many articles which even made a passing reference uh, to the Second Amendment. It was a time when the Second Amendment was very much alive in the, the minds of the public and continuing to exercise their Second Amendment rights, but it was a time when the, the legal scholarly community wasn't paying much attention to the Second Amendment one way or the other. It's a different situation today when there are over a hundred law review articles discussing the right to arms, including some by the biggest names in American constitutional law. Professor Sanford Levinson of Texas, William Van Alstine of William and Mary. There are also numerous books on the subject. Professor Curtis's Comprehensive History of the 14th Amendment, Professor Akhil Amar's Study of the Bill of Rights, 
the advantages of being a professor is you can read about anything and call it research. So Second came back to a country that was really well armed by an army that had executed his father. He was naturally very anxious. He had very few guns at his own command. And so he, uh, through the Privy Council, through his own council, uh, instituted controls on uh, gun makers. They had to report every Saturday night um, to the uh, government what guns they had produced in the course of the week, um, who had bought them. Uh, there were controls on importing weapons. There were licenses if you wanted to move weapons around the countryside. You had to get a pass to do that. And then there were a, a series of orders to disarm all sorts of people who he felt were um, likely to be opponents or had been opponents in the past. So there was a lot of disarming that went on, and then there was this effort to really control the guns that were being manufactured in the country. One of the acts that the new parliament of royalists passed was the Militia Act of 1662. And this act actually gave militia officers who were country gentlemen of the right sort, power to disarm anyone that they felt was likely to be an opponent of the crown. When the Militia Act was first passed, it was the orders about disarming were very rigorously followed. So when there were, you know, fears of a plot to overthrow the king or have an uprising, orders would go out to the lieutenants general in the different counties to disarm potential opponents, and they actually did it. But I think after a while, year after year of these alarms, uh, they began to be rather tired of, of this exercise. In 1671, Parliament passed a Game Act, which was actually um, a far broader control of the ownership of firearms than England had ever had before. It was meant uh, ostensibly to allow a gentleman on his own property to um, make sure that only he and equally privileged people were able to hunt game. Um, but it, it listed a whole series of prohibited weapons. Every man having a man-child or men-children in his house shall provide, ordain, and have in his house for every man-child being of the age of seven years and above until he shall come to the age of seventeen years, a bow and two shafts to enthuse and learn them and bring them up in shooting an act concerning shooting in longbows, 1511. By the end of Henry's reign, early firearms known as harquebuses were in common use. Henry's daughter Elizabeth oversaw the changeover from bows to harquebuses and also the organization of English civilians into what came to be known as the militia, governed by her lord's lieutenant. The Calendar of State Papers, the official index of government documents for a reign, shows her council demanding reports on the militia and on what every Lord Lieutenant was doing to promote harquebus ownership and shooting. The last entry on the page shows how far some Lord's Lieutenant were willing to go to make sure that their people owned firearms and practiced shooting with them. But how did the duty to have arms come to be seen as a right to have them? We asked Professor Joyce Malcolm, a fellow of the Royal Historical Society and whose book on the subject was published by Harvard University Press. She found that the change arose out of the chaos of 17th century England, when conflict arose between King Charles I and his Parliament. In 1642, civil war broke out between King and Parliament. King Charles was eventually captured and beheaded. His sons, the future Charles II and James II, fled to France and England came to be ruled by Oliver Cromwell's military dictatorship. Oliver Cromwell, who was the most successful general throughout the parliament, took over and ruled by himself for some years. And when he died, his son came to, the, uh, to power, but there was just chaos. And eventually, out of desperation, uh, the English people uh, formed a kind of parliament and asked the uh, heir to the Stuart throne, Charles II, to come back and rule. Charles the 